Good afternoon everyone, Country Flyboy here, and today the engine start and taxi out of the Cessna 208 tutorial. So we are here at Fernandina Beach Municipal Airport, Fernandina Beach, Florida, in the Cessna 208 caravan. This is the Cargo Master or Super Cargo Master version. We'll be doing most of the uh, series in this caravan, though again we will be looking at other caravans as they are they're all pretty much the same. Uh, the, we'll be doing the Super Cargo Master version today. We're here at our little hangar. Push the airplane out. We're ready to go. We got a flight plan ready, and uh, we'll be doing the training videos. So, first thing I want to talk about is for the video engine startup and taxi. We're going to be discussing the engine itself and various things about it. Uh, then we'll uh, actually start the engine. We'll go over how to start the engine. Then we start it. Then we'll taxi out and talk a little bit about that. Uh, then we'll end the video there. We'll do engine run up and takeoffs in the next video after this one. Uh, so I think the first thing we should do is go over a couple of things. Now this will be mostly in the Coronado Caravan, the C208. Uh, fun thing here, in the f first, the C208B and the Super Cargo Master, which is the same thing essentially, Carnado didn't get everything 100% right. Uh, it's a little bit more accurate if you have the Carnado Caravan EX. They did a little bit of a better job there. But uh, notably, the avionics buses 1 and 2 both come on at the same time. Uh, so there's only one avionics bus essentially. Uh, the ignition system is not correct. Neither is the generator. And most of these switches are not the three position switches like they should be. So like generator fuel boost and starter is supposed to all be three position switches but only two positions are modeled on each of them so none of that's right also when you get to the inverter on the checklist don't bother looking around for it you're not going to find it on this plane the inverter is not modeled so don't worry about that anyway um, other, other than that it's pretty much just like any default airplane from then on or any other typical car and auto add-on uh, I'm gonna hide the yoke real quick so it's not in the way so first thing I think we're gonna go over is the checklist itself so let me disable post-processing if you hit shift F10 to bring up the checklist you'll find that Carnado did not include an in sim checklist on the kneeboard I really wish more developers would make use of this because it's very very useful having an in sim checklist can be very useful and unfortunately most developers just ignore this it's kinda sad but they did have reference information so if you ever forget a particular speed uh, just look at this but they did give us an in sim checklist notably we hit shift F2 and we get a little window with all the checklists we want uh, including emergency checklists and a couple of charts in there as well. So we're going to be making use of this today and throughout the videos. Uh, first thing I want to mention is the way you're supposed to use these. There's two ways checklists get done and that is the do list as in you get to an item on the list, you do it, you check it, then you move on. Then there's the actual proper way of flows and checks. So the way it's supposed to work in real life is you do things, you do a flow, which is stuff you do from memory, then you run the checklist, and the checklist hits stuff that the flow doesn't cover and makes sure that you did stuff in the flow. Now, unfortunately, in this particular um, checklist, they did not do a very good job, and by not good job, I mean they didn't even try, to uh, specify what parts of these checklists are flows and what are checks. So I'll try to try to remember to let you know which items are the flow items but it, it pretty much is you just uh you do the flow you'll see they're in startup because like most of the stuff on startup is part of the flow and not actually running down the checklist alrighty so let's go ahead and I'm gonna run through the uh, before starting engine checklist real quick uh, so pre-flight inspection is complete doors are unlocked so first thing I want to go over is engine indications and controls down here we're gonna go over each one and what it does so right here we have the foot pounds and this is basically the torque of the engine right here this is how many how much torque the um, the engine is generating in foot pounds times 100 so this is 500 1000 1500 2000 so on right here we have a 
I think that's 1860, and right here is like 1975. Uh, these are two red marks. We'll talk about them when they come to it, but notably this first red mark here is maximum allowable for takeoff uh, when power is set to 1900 RPM. This, these are your maximums here on this little texture, and they correspond to these little red marks here. So 1865, this first one, which is your max takeoff RPM at 1900 or max takeoff foot pounds at 1900 RPM. And the second red mark is 1970, and that's the maximum for all these various RPMs here. Next one here is the propeller RPM. Uh, this measures the how fast the propeller is spinning. It's in RPM times 100, so 400, 800, 1200, 1600, so on. Green arc is normal operating range, red is maximum. Right here we have the in inter turbo Interstage turbine temperature. Uh, this is the temperature of the exhaust gases measured between high pressure and low pressure turbines. Uh, more on, you'll understand more about that when we talk about the engine, but this is a vitally important gauge here. You're going to be watching this all the time because you want it to be in green arc most of the time, if not all the time, but it's vitally important it never goes above this red line. Uh, if it does, it can do some damage, but as long as you limit the amount of time it's above this red line, you should be fine. However, you definitely never want to see it come all the way over here. Particularly during startup, you watch this gauge, because if it passed this red line and starts accelerating quicker to this one, like quickly approaching this red line, uh, you have a hot start and you need to shut down the engine. You do not want it to approach this red line or you could burst the engine into flames. Now this gauge here is the NG or gas generator RPM. Uh, inside the engine, the gas generator section consists of the entire compressor assembly plus the, um, the first start turbine that the gas comes to. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get into the engine itself, but this is the RPM of the gas generator. Basically, this is how fast your compressors are turning, essentially. So this is, this is in uh, percent RPM. Here we have 2,000, 4,000, 6, 8, so on. Uh, this inner dial here measures the decimal, so this is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 3, so on and so forth. Now here's our oil gauge. On the left we have oil pressure. On the right we have oil temperature. Green arc is the normal operating range for all phases of flight. Here we have fuel flow in pounds per hour. Important to note, most fuel measurements in the caravan are done by pounds, not gallons, as is most other Cessna aircraft or smaller GA planes it's in pounds in this plane. Pounds times 100, so 100, 200, 300. This is really just used to tell you how fast or you're burning your fuel. And right here we have the fuel gauges, left tank, right tank, and we have a reading for both pounds, the white numbers, and the inner numbers, the blue ones, those are for gallons. So you can instantly tell either way what you have, pounds or gallons. All right, so there are all of our engine gauges right there. Now down here we have the uh, the engine controls. So pretty uh, standard for most airplanes here. We have throttle, we have propeller, and now common misconception, this is not a fuel mixture. Uh, some people do tend to think of this as a fuel mixture. It's not. This is a condition lever. This uh, basically controls the fuel scheduling of the engine. It tells the fuel control unit how to uh, schedule the fuel to go into the combustion chambers. We have two settings. We have, or we have two detents. We have low idle and we have high idle. Most flight conditions uh, from takeoff to landing will be in high idle. You can fly in the low idle position. Low idle is usually used for ground ops, but you can use it in the air. High idle is only used for flight ops. You will not be using high idle on the ground. You can set the condition lever anywhere between the two detents. Way down here is cutoff. Now during engine startup, we will slowly advance this forward to the low idle position. But down here is where fuel is cut off. Now, one reason I think people get mixed up is because in flight simulator, although this is the condition lever, this is bound to the same key as your uh, fuel mixture is on other airplanes. That's not because it's a different control, or it's not because it's the same control. It's done that way for convenience. 
So if you're using the keyboard, the default key commands is control shift and then use the F1 through F4 keys to control it. So F3 will slowly advance, F2 will slowly um, retract. And it's the same with this one here. We have the propeller. This is used with the control key uh, like it is on other airplanes. So control F3 advances forward, control F2 brings it back, and control F1 will return it to not feather minimum notice that when i'm using control f1 or if i use the mouse it stops at that detent that is not feathered that is minimum pitch to feather it you actually have to bring it further back by holding down the control key unless you've rebound your keys these are the defaults holding down the control key and pushing f2 that will bring it back into the feather range so this is where it's going to be if you have an engine failure or if you need to, uh, or when you shut down the engine, you bring it back to here. And of course we have the throttle. Now let me move the, the uh, emergency power lever out of the way real quick. The throttle is a bit special. So up here we have full throttle as normal and down here we have idle, but this is flight idle. If we hit F2 once, no control or shift, just F2. That will bring it back into the beta range. Hit it again, we'll bring it further into the beta range. A third time, we'll bring it back into reverse. So if you look at the throttle here, it's a bit sensitive when grabbed with the mouse. So be careful grabbing it with the mouse. But beta range, uh, basically, beta range is uh, the operations you used on the ground. Uh, the beta range is anywhere between flight idle and full reverse. And in beta range, this knob here will control the propeller pitch itself. So here, our propeller pitch, when we're in flight idle, is controlled by this lever. But when we bring it back into the beta range, then this starts controlling propeller pitch. So normally, we'll bring it between these two lines for ground ops. Uh, typically, when landing, uh, we'll hit it back to here, maybe twice to bring it back. It doesn't quite put the engine in reverse. It just sort of, it just sort of gives us a easier time on the wheel brakes. Uh, it, it can save the, it can, it can extend the life of your brakes a little bit by using beta range to help slow you down during uh, landing. Uh, you can use it during taxi, but there's a bit of a way flight sim handles throttle. Uh, in that you're not going to be moving forward unless you advance it just a little bit. So you're going to usually be using flight idle for ground ops in flight sim, but in real life, you'd be using the beta range. Now, of course, advancing it past that second line here puts it in reverse. And the reverse on this airplane basically reverses the pitch of the propeller into the negative so that it starts drawing air the opposite way, acting as a reverser for us. So that is the beta range. And of course here we have the emergency power lever. We'll talk about this uh, some other time. But basically this does something. I can't quite remember what the... All right, that will discuss the engine details as far as um, uh, indications and controls. Let's talk about the engine itself. The Cessna 208 is fitted with a Pratt & Whitney PT6A engine producing 675 shaft horsepower. The propeller is a Macaulay three-blade three blade, constant speed, full feathering, reversible propeller. It's at 106 inches in diameter. Uh, the aircraft is approved to burn Jet A, Jet A1, and Jet B, as well as JP1, 4, 5, and 8. In an emergency, it can burn all grades of aviation fuel, both military and civil. However, Use of non-approved fuels must be limited to 150 hours total in one overhaul period. Uh, the engine is a turbine engine and utilizes two independent turbines. One drives the compressor in the gas separator section. The other drives the reduction gearing for the propeller. Air enters the front air intake of the aircraft passing through a channel along the side of the engine cowling here. And then the air inlet for the engine itself is uh, located towards the back. This is a reverse flow engine. So the air inlet for the engine itself is actually back here. Air enters here and will actually throw flow out through, th through this hole here unless it goes into the air inlet. 
uh, for the engine itself. Air enters uh, the inlet of the engine, passing through a screen and then into the compressor section. The air is compressed there and moves on to the combustion chamber, where it is mixed with fuel and ignited. It then moves to the turbine section. There are three turbines there. The first is the gas generator turbine, uh, which is connected to the compressor section. Again, the, the gas generator turbine and the compressor together form the gas generator. And then the whole purpose of that is to just generate gases to move the other two turbines. That's how it works. Gas generator moves, it generates gases via the combustion process to move the other two turbines. The other two turbines are the uh, propeller generators. They turn a shaft that's connected to a two-stage planetary reduction gearbox. And this gearbox is what drives the propeller. Uh, the gases is then exhausted out of the aircraft via the exhaust pipe, which is located on this side. So if you've ever looked at the caravan and wondered why is it its exhaust pipe channeled from the front and not the back, that's why. It's a reverse flow engine. All right, so we're basically ready to start the engine now. Uh, the thing I want to go through real quick is we're going to run through the start procedure without actually starting the engine. All right, so I got a checklist brought up here. All right, battery on. Uh, I don't want to kill the battery because it only has a finite amount of time it can run. So I'm not going to turn the battery on. So battery on, volt and ammeter, check. What you want to do, this knob here controls the volt ammeter. And basically, it tells you how much power you're getting out of generator, alternator, battery, and voltage. So we want to check and make sure we have 24 volts minimum. This is important. We'll talk about it towards the end, but it's important that we have at least 24 volts, no less than that. So voltmeter check, 24 volts. Inner ring is the volts, by the way. There's 25, so right there is where we want to see it. All right, emergency power lever is in the normal position, and the enunciator is out. Propeller area is clear. Nobody's hanging around the propeller. All right, fuel boost pump, we'll turn that on. Auxiliary fuel pump on, and fuel pressure low off. This is referring to the, um, the enunciators up here, so we should see the aux fuel pump on and fuel pressure low go off. Then we'll look over fuel flow. There should be no fuel flow from the, uh, the tanks. Next, we move the starter to start. Uh, ignition does not have to be on, just has to be in the normal position. Starter will move over to start. And uh, by the way, this is where we stop because everything from here on out, at least down to the bottom, is a flow. So from the moment we flip the starter on, we want to have the checklist hidden because we do everything else from memory. Now, a special note about the starter in this airplane. The starter pulls double duty as both the starter and the generator. It's sometimes called, unoriginally, the starter generator. Uh, it's mounted on top of the accessory gearbox at the rear of the engine. It's a 28 volt, 200 amp engine driven unit that functions as a motor to start the engine. After the engine is started and running, the generator it will function as a generator for the engine. Now, there is a speed sensing switch that will automatically shut down the starter function of the starter generator and switch it over to the generator mode. That way you won't have any overspeed damage to the starter. So the, uh, the actual, there's an actual starter schedule here that we need to talk about. And basically this is how often we can run the starter. It starts with we can have the starter on for 30 seconds. If the engine does not turn over and start up in that 30 seconds, we flip it off. We have to wait 60 seconds again before we can try again. Uh, we have to do that twice. So 30 seconds on, 60 seconds off, 30 seconds on, 60 seconds off. And then the last bit, if we do 30 seconds on, engine doesn't start, we flip it off and we have to wait a full 30 minutes because of the starter schedule. We don't want to overstress the starter. Moving from there, if now that's if we're using the battery. Uh, if we're using external power to start the engine, which is possible in Flight Sim, uh, I'm going to have another video coming up after this tutorial series that talks about 
ways you can modify aircraft CFG files. And one of the ways is you can actually put uh, an external power unit on essentially any aircraft. It's a bit of a hack, or it's not even really a hack. It's just using something uh, other than a, a third-party program. It's just using something that's built into the simulator in a different way. But you can actually have an external power unit on any aircraft in flight sim. It is doable. Now, if we are, if you have modified the aircraft CFG to have this feature, then using the external power generator to start the uh, aircraft, you can run the starter for 20 seconds on, 120 seconds off. So drop the start by 10 seconds and double the uh, rest period. So 20 on, 120 off, 20 on, 120 off, 20 on, 60 minutes off. That's the schedule if you're using external power. Okay, so again, everything from starter on is a flow. So it happens really quickly. We, that's why we need to have it down to memory. So once the starter on, verify starter energize and ignition enunciators illuminate, which is these two right here, top right corner. Those two will come on. Starter energize, ignition on. Check for a positive indication of oil pressure, which basically means look over at this gauge here and check that we have oil pressure rising. That's what we're looking for. Don't really focus on it, just glance at it, make sure the oil pressure is rising. Next, turn your attention to the NG or gas generator RPM. It will stabilize at 12%. Now there's a bit of a thing in FSX. It may only stabilize at 11%. Uh, so it, it does that in the default. I think with the Coronado, it tends to go up to 12%, but usually in default, it seems to want to stabilize right at 11. So it's okay if it stabilizes at 11 instead of 12, just go ahead and uh, follow the checklist as normal. Once this has stabilized at 12, we slowly will advance the condition lever up to low idle. It's vitally important you do this slowly. Don't insta chunk it up there, especially don't put it up to high idle. You will get a hot start if you do that. Slowly bring it up to low idle. All right. Now the engine will turn over then and it will start accelerating. During the acceleration to idle, it's gonna idle at about 52% NG which is right here at the bottom of the green arc. That's the first mark on the bottom of the green arc. That's where it normally idles. As it starts uh, spinning up to that speed, monitor ITT. Again, very important. You do not let this go rapidly approaching this. It's okay if it goes above the red line for a small amount of time, the first red line. But if it's rapidly approaching this second red mark here, then we have a problem. You need to shut that engine down because you you could risk blowing it up. That's really, it can burst into flames. So definitely want to watch ITT. Now after the engine has stabilized at idle, the starter engine enunciator should cut off because again, starter pulls double duty as a generator and the speed sensing switch should flip it from starter to generator except it won't. In flight sim, it was not modeled that way correctly. So unfortunately, that that light is tied to this switch here. So you will not be getting AC power from your generator until this switch is flipped on, even though in real life, the speed sensing switch will actually flip the starter over to generator mode. You have to do that manually in flight sim. It won't do it correctly. So the enunciators won't deal or won't go out like they're supposed to. Uh, it's a minor bug. It's no real big deal though. All right. So now I believe we are ready to start the engine. So I'm going to go ahead and shut my door and the co-pilot door. I'm going to go ahead and bring this back, advance this forward where it's supposed to be. I'll open my window. Why not? Alrighty. So we are ready to start the engine. We're going to run through the checklist now, just like we did in the more explained section just a second ago. So battery on, voltmeter, we have 24 volts. Emergency power lever is normal. Propeller area is clear. Fuel boost pump is on. I hear the pump come on. Uh, low fuel pressure is off. Ox pumps on. We have no fuel flow. All right, starter switch is on. Again, everything from here on out is a flow. So starter on. 
Oil pressure is rising. Watching the NG to stabilize at 12%. There it is. Control lever slowly to low idle. RPM's rising. ITT's rising. It's not rising anymore. It's declining. It did not go above red line. RPM. Gauge. All of the gauges are rising. Watching the engine closely. Make sure we don't get a hot start. Keep an eye on the ITT and the percent gas generator gauge. All right, all the gauges look to be stable now. Everything's cushy. All right, so now I'm going to flip. Now we go to the rest of the flow, which is starting from starter. One, two, three. So we just click these switches. One, two, three from here. Starter off, fuel off, generator on. And the engine is started up. It's not 100% following the real world procedure. It is slightly different, but that's how it is in flight sim so again the last bit once the engine is stable one two three just like a reverse L right there now one thing I did forget to do is turn on the beacon light that should be on prior to engine start now notice a few differences between the procedure we outlined that procedure we outlined was the real world start procedure and notice we're not idling at 52 uh, we're actually idling at 64 no, wait, 266. This seems to be where it wants to idle in Flight Sim. It, it never really wants to idle on the lower end at 52. Uh, bit odd, but whatever. It, it just doesn't idle at 52 like it should. All right, so let's continue uh, our checklist. We already ran through all that as part of the flow. All right, engine instruments are checked. Generator is off. All right, wait. Gen off. No, wait. Charging. So gen on. Our gen off lights are extinguished, and we want to get a positive indication on the generator here that it is charging. All right. Fuel boost is off. No enunciator. And standby power. We flip standby power to on. Avionics bus the one and two on. Nav and beacon light check as required. Beacon light's the only one we need right now. Suction gauge, we're in the green arc. Uh, heating, ventilation, and defrost as required. Don't really need it in this airplane in the sim. And radios as required. All right, that is the engine startup. A few more things I want to talk about. Uh, one thing I want to note is if the outside air temperature is high, your outside air temperature is up on your top left, by the way. As you can see, it's about 15 degrees Celsius today. If the outside air temperature is high or you're at an airport with a high ground elevation, the engine ITT may exceed the maximum ID, ITT limitation. Maximum ITT limitation is 685. So when the engine is idling like it is now, you don't want to see this climb up to 685. Two, four, six, eight, right there. That mark right before seven. You don't want to see above that. It tends to want to idle where it is now, but high I, high OAT and high ground elevation, it may idle higher than the maximum or the minimum specified. If that's the case, it is okay to advance the throttle a little bit, which actually will lower the ITT somewhat. All right. And the other thing is a cold start. If the engine is not been ran for a long time, like say it's been set overnight and it's freezing cold at night, it may not quite idle at 52% NG. Uh, that's normal. If that's the case, it's okay to advance the power lever or even the condition lever above their normal ground positions, like right here, to get the engine running a little warmer to get up to that 52% NG on idle. It's totally fine. Just make sure you watch your gauges a little closer. Now, a few quick reminders. Remember, your ITT is limited to 1090, or this second red mark here, during startup. Vitally important you monitor ITT during startup, as if it exceeds the maximum or rapidly approaches the maximum, you need to shut down the engine to guard against a possible engine fire. Now, the other thing is, remember to check that you have 
24 volts prior to starting the engine. Very, very important. However, remember a reading of 24 volts is not always an indication of battery charge or condition, especially if it's a NICAD battery on the plane. They will maintain a 24 volt charge with less than 50%. Or, or 24 volts with less than 50% charge. So battery voltage is vitally important you check because if you don't have 24, if you have less than 24, low battery voltage is one possible cause of a hot start. All right, now we've talked about what the beta range is and we've also talked about how it doesn't really function 100% correctly in flight sim. So we're gonna taxi out now. I'm gonna taxi us uh, over there where those two X's are at the engine run up. Uh, that's a closed runway, but we can use it for engine run up today. So I'm going to slowly taxi us over there. Now there's a couple of things we need to talk about for our taxi out. And that is always go slow. Start out slow. The other thing is, especially if we're flying IFR, we want to check and make sure our flight instruments, our six pack, are functioning. Notably, the HSI and the turn coordinator. We have a 90 degree turn to make here. So when we make this turn, we want to make sure the HSI turns in the correct direction, i.e. it turns right if we turn right and left if we turn left. We want to make sure the, um, the turn coordinator turns in the correct direction, right if we turn right, left if we turn left, and the slip ball thing goes full left or full right depending on which way we turn. So we want to verify that that is correct. So as we make our turn here, HSI turned right, turn coordinator turned right, ball went full left. All that is correct. That is how it's supposed to do it. Uh, so all that is functioning like it should. Next thing we want to remember is wind. Now, common misconception is you don't use ailerons during taxi. In reality, you do. Your ailerons are for crosswind corrections during taxi. Let's say my CDI needle is going to be my wind. Let's say that the wind was coming from the southeast, right about there. So, and it's howling at 10 knots. We need to use the ailerons to correct for the crosswind, or the wind could pitch our airplane over and damage it. So, the correct wind um, crosswind correction for taxiing is the old adage, turn towards and dive away from. If we have a tailwind, we dive away from it. If we have a headwind, we turn towards it. So it's important to set either the CDI needle or the heading bug to the wind direction specified by the AWOS, ASOS, or ATIS, wherever you get it from. So, or you can, you know, if you ever have a question in flight sim, you can hit shift Z and you can see the winds right here. Winds are six at zero, so they're calm right now. But let's pretend the winds were coming out of the southeast at 15 knots or 10 knots. So right now that would be a tailwind for us. So we want to dive away from it. So full down elevator and bank to the right. If we have a left tailwind, full down elevator, bank to the right, dive away from it. And if it was a right tailwind, full down elevator, bank to the left, down elevator, bank away from it. Now for headwinds, like this one, if we have a right headwind, we just simply turn towards it. Elevator in the neutral position and turn towards the wind. So we have a right tailwind, we bank to the right. And the same with a left tailwind, or le left headwind, sorry, you bank to the left. All right, I am going to taxi us over to the engine run-up area and just one last thing we want to go over. All right, so we're here over in the run-up area. The last thing I want to talk about is an engine fire. Engine fire during the startup procedure. Now, engine fire is definitely a checklist that you really probably want to have all of it memorized. There's about eight items on the checklist, but it's vitally important you have the first three items memorized. So, Engine fire. We're starting our engine and all of a sudden we see visible smoke and flames coming from the engine. Our very first reaction should be condition lever, 
to cut off and the fuel boost pump fuel boost pump to off so it's it's pretty much a flow one two one two now there's a third item which is start switch to motor again though we can't quite flip the switch it's in the motor position now but after startup it's supposed to go to off so again we can't put it in the motor position like we're supposed to in this caravan the ex of caravan you actually can but uh i don't know if it functions but you can so to modify that checklist to work in flight sim we just leave it in the start position now we need to watch the fire as the mo as we left the um, thing in the start position we need to watch it and we're looking to see if the fire persists as indicated by a sustained inner turbine temperature so if the itt is like pegged all the way over here or where between these it really doesn't matter as long if that itt is not moving that means the fire is sustained i.e it's not out if that's the case we immediately close the fuel shutoff valve and continue to motor the starter if the fire from then on after the fire goes out or even if it doesn't go out starter switch goes to off fuel shutoff is off pulled out you probably would have done this already battery switch off airplane evacuate fire extinguish now that fire extinguish section let's talk a little bit about how flight sim handles failures there's two types of failures in flight sim and that is the regular failures that you can trigger through the failures menu here and there's also situational failures which are triggered by events in the simulator the most common situational failure is a frozen pitot tube uh, if you were to fly in icing conditions in flight sim without the pitot heat turned on you will lose your airspeed indicator uh, this happens across the board for most if not all airplanes in flight sim that is a situational failure other situational failures include engine detonation. The default P-51 has that. So, uh, some aircraft may have it programmed to start an engine fire given certain conditions. If it's a situational failure like that, then you will not be able to clear it by clearing failures on here. Instead, what you need to do is bring up your key commands which, uh, believe it or not, this key command is not assigned by default, but it's under, I think it's under General Aircraft Commands. Yes, right here. Repair and Refuel. I have it bound to Control Shift R. I don't think that's bound by default, but I do recommend binding it to something. And what that will do is if you ever have a situational failure or a failure that can't be cleared by this, then you hit that key command, Control Shift R. That will clear all failures and it will also refuel the plane to 100% fuel. So that is a key command you need to know about. So that consider that your fire extinguisher. All right, so again, to go over the uh, engine fire procedure, if you see flames, fuel condition lever cut off and uh, fuel boost pump off leave the starter switch in the start position because you can't put it in motor watch ITT if ITT remains the same the fire did not stop and you bring this out leave the um, leave the thing running until the uh, the fire actually does stop after that or even if it doesn't stop starter switch off fuel shut off off battery off evacuate the airplane and repair or re repair and refuel or in this case we're going to say extinguish the fire like we just talked about all right so that was the startup procedure for the cessna 208 caravan hope you enjoyed it and we shall see you next time